without further ado, I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Sanjay Bhattacharji from our School of Computing, talking about the subject of scanned handwritten signatures fodder for forgery. Sanjay, over to you. Thank you, thank you, Marcus. Okay. Uh, well, good afternoon, good morning, in whichever part of the world you are. Uh, very welcome to this uh, webinar. Uh, I'm very glad uh, to be giving this talk. Uh, I hope all of you enjoy it. As Marcus mentioned, uh, at any point during this talk, if you feel like asking any kind of questions, please, please interrupt me. Uh, type, type your questions in the in the chat box, and I'll be I'll be taking the questions then on. Marcus will read the chat box to me, and then I'll follow it up. Okay, so uh, uh, the the topic for today is scanned handwritten signatures fodder for forgery. Uh, I'll start with a brief introduction about myself. So I'm a lecturer in cybersecurity in the University of Kent. I'm a member of two research groups here, both uh, interdisciplinary research groups, uh, mainly focused on cybersecurity. <clears throat> My areas of research are cryptology, blockchains, and cooperative game theory. So within cryptology, I have been doing, mostly doing uh, broadcast encryption. So my PhD topic was a symmetry key broadcast encryption, which is, which is, uh, which is used in, in digital rights management uh, systems. Uh, for example, in, in pay TV, in optical discs, uh, where, whenever we would like to stop unauthorized access of digital media, we use uh, digital rights management systems and broadcast encryption is the cryptographic uh, way of doing it. Uh, I've also worked on public key schemes for broadcast encryption. Uh, in blockchains, I, I have worked on the security aspects of blockchains. In cooperative game theory, I've been working on uh, voting games, which is typically used in, in policy making bodies, for example, the United Nations Security Council, the IMF, the EU, the GST Council of India, and so on. Uh, I've worked in the industry uh, briefly. I've worked as a network security developer. Uh, the project which I was working on is uh, now a part of McAfee's data center security suit for databases. I worked as a tester, and I was, uh, I mean, when I was working on uh, a GSM mobile networks switching equipment. Uh, I was doing testing for uh, for the kind of messaging that happens in GSM networks. These are these are all pretty. I mean, almost ten years back. I've recently done some consulting, uh, full stack design and development of secure web based information systems. Now, without further ado, uh, let's move into the topic directly. So let's start with uh, traditional signatures. So uh, traditional signatures, they provide different kinds of assurances, right? But the most important one is non-repudiation. So when a person signs a document physically, the one of the most important aspects is the person gets identified uniquely. The, the identity of the person is uniquely established. Uh, when we are signing by hand, uh, it's, it's, it's more or less understood uh, based on the, the scientific theory that we have on biometrics that two people cannot have the same exact signature. Once a document has been signed, it is a kind of authentication that the person who, who is signing it has agreed and authorized uh, the, the document. So whatever is the content of the document. So it's a way of giving consent that yes, uh, I or we, we comply or we agree to the, the content of the document. Non-repudiation, as I mentioned initially, is one of the, one of the key aspects of any, any kind of signature. Uh, what it means is once I have signed a document, once anybody has signed a document, he or she or they later 
cannot deny giving consent or later cannot deny having authorized that particular document. And one kind of authorization is as a witness, a witness of a, a particular uh, a particular event, the document uh, would have that event written down. So uh, being being a witness to to a particular event. So these are the overall uh, implications of of uh, signatures in in real life. Now, the question of identity comes in whenever we are talking about signatures. So uniquely establishing an identity of a person or a group, if if it's not a hand, handwritten signature, then it's it it might be a group. Or even for authorized signatories, it's it's a group that that authorized signatory would typically be be representing. So what's an identity? An identity is a combination of characteristics that identifies a person, right? Now, single characteristics, a single characteristic is usually not enough to tell one person apart from another, but a combination of characteristics might be enough. Some identifying characteristics for a person would be name, date of birth, address, and so on, right? Now, once the identity has been established, there is a question of checking the identity. There is a question of authenticating the person or the group. So if you, you belong to an organization that, that tries to check for identity that, that does authentication of users, so in what circumstances would you be wanting to do that? So if, if you or your service shows a user personal information about themselves, such as their li li driving license or passport details, or if it gives the user something valuable, such as money or benefits, you would like to check the identity. You would like the user to authenticate herself or himself, right? Now, there are different mechanisms of doing that. Digitally, that's something which we will be looking at today. Over the phone, we, we, we can ask for credentials of, of, of the individual or the group represented by the individual, by post, by email, face to face, there are different mechanisms of authenticating a person, right? Now, the UK government uh, guidance for authentication mentions there are different types of authenticators. So not every kind of contract. So whenever there, there's a question of a signature, there is an implicit contract there, right? So not every kind of contract requires the strictest level of authentication, right? So, so I mean, there are different kinds of authenticators in that that one may use, right? So these would be based on different principles. So an authenticator may be based on something that the user knows. So for example, a PIN, a password, a knowledge-based verification. For example, if somebody asks me, so what is your mother's maiden name? So that's a very common question. So whenever we are doing knowledge-based verification, right? So that's a, that's a way of authentication where we would ask the user to provide something that the user knows. Similarly, something that the user has, for example, a physical security key, so which has to be inserted into a computer or it has to be tapped against a phone. Right? So something that the user has would be authenticating the user. Something that the user is, like biological characteristics, for example, their fingerprints, or, or one can use the facial recognition system, or maybe even voice. Right. So biological characteristics, or behavioral characteristics. Handwritten signatures are typically considered as uh, something between well, I mean, something that incorporates both well, biometrics and behavioral characteristics. There are there are several available resources which are which are provided by the UK government. The UK Verify system is one of the most used and and prevalent system. There is so much documentation around this. There's so much information out there. I I thought of not going into details of the UK. Uh, the gov.uk verify system. 
you can you can explore this and and i'll be providing the slides as marcus mentioned at the end of this uh, talk you can explore each of these links and and that will give you a good amount of information regarding what the uk government particular provides for identity as well as authentication of systems but there's something which uh, we can of course look at in the context of uk in the context of uh, uh, in a broader context so which is what amounts to a valid signature whenever there is a document we are we are signing it whenever there's a contract we are signing it so what exactly amounts to be a valid signature so i'm i'm definitely not a legal expert i i'm i'm an enthusiast at most but definitely not an expert so here is uh, an article by an international law firm this is a very recent article uh, in the context of which has come out in the context of covid it is titled uh, using electronic signatures to avoid meetings and inputs and signings so this article talks about the validity of a signature so to quote from it the courts have held the following non electronic forms as valid signatures for example if i just sign with an x that at times can actually be considered as a valid signature signing with initials only so ms sb ab just just our initials right we just uh, sign with our initials using a stamp of a handwritten signature just printing of a name signing with a mark even when the party executing the mark can write a description of a signatory is if it is sufficiently ambiguous such as your loving mother more importantly electronic equivalents of these non electronic forms of signatures are likely to be recognized by a court as legally valid there is no reason in principle to think otherwise now as i mentioned to you i'm definitely not a legal expert but uh, first of all this has to be judged in a context all these all these points have to be judged in a context so in certain contexts maybe these are these are uh, these are considered to be legitimate uh, signatures but as you can think about it each of these might be very easily uh, easily forged easily copied if i have a digital document uh, i i just i just uh, i just cut out the the signature part if it's a handwritten signature i just cut out the signature part and paste it on something else and uh, the the signature gets transferred right uh, the handwritten signature gets transferred now it may or may not be admissible in court but it might actually be used to fool someone so if there's a handwritten signature which uh, of of some authority in my university and i i just uh, i i get hold of that signature from some document i i copy it into some other document and uh, show it to somebody claiming that this is something which this person has written or or approved and maybe i get access to something which i'm actually not authorized to so digital copies of these physical forms of signatures or authentications they are definitely they are definitely easily forgeable and our attempts should be to avoid this kind of signatures as much as possible of course if it's too much of a trouble and if the context is not very not very important it's 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 uh, well there there there'll probably be no harm in just signing with an, with an x and and everybody around are trusted then probably that's fine but in in a larger context in most contexts wherever uh, these things might be used as a way a mechanism to fool somebody if not actually trying to fool somebody uh, on a on a legal scale i mean something which might get challenged later at, at a legal scale it's it's probably better to go 
with alternatives, especially because they are easily available. So it's, it's better to go with alternatives which can assure less likelihood of forging. Right? So that's, that's the overall theme of, of today's talk, that we will try to find ways, we'll try to understand how the digital counterparts of, of uh, handwritten signatures or handwritten authentication systems, they work. We'll try to understand the theory behind it. We'll try to look at a few tools who, who, which, which can be used in, in different contexts. We'll try to do a comparison between these handwritten or physical forms of signatures with the digital alternatives, right? Okay, so uh, again, uh, to quote from the same article, certain types of documents present greater risk or require wet link signature. So uh, not, not all documents can be just signed with an X, right? So certain kinds of documents are indeed required. And for, for those documents to be valid uh, in a legal context, they are required to have wet ink signatures. Uh, for example, so different types of contracts, uh, they require different levels of assurances from signatures. So does it need to be in a certain form? If, if I'm a customer, and it's a customer contract that I'm signing, then I need to sign a particular form provided by the company, right? Is there a requirement on the process? For example, if, if there's a particular ordering for, for the signing. So first, the, the, the person who is getting the rent signs and then somebody who is a witness signs and things like that. So does the contract have to be in writing? Are electronic documents not admissible? Then evidential requirements, for example, place, time, et cetera, how, how does that impact the signature requirements or the validity of the signature over a period of time or over a, I mean, a small, small amount of time? Formalities may vary uh, for UK companies. For if, if you're thinking about the legal context within the UK, then the requirements from overseas companies might be different. For individuals, it might be different. All these things have to be considered when, when we think about the validity of, of signatures. Witness requirements, as I mentioned before, can, can, uh, can signatories delegate their, their capacity to sign or the authority to sign to, to, to subordinates, say, in subordinates within a company, for example. Uh, then board resolution, whenever there is a delegation that is required, there might be a requirement for a board resolution or a power of attorney for, the, for that delegation. So validity of signatures might have different, I mean, there might be different contexts in which a certain kind of signature might be considered valid or not valid. And here are a few examples of, of those contexts. But there is, the digital alternative, which has slowly creeped in into our society. And uh, these are very efficient, considerably uh, reliable ways of, of uh, signing documents. So the, the regulation uh, of the European Parliament and of the Council uh, of 2014 that was passed, uh, it, it makes an electronic signature to be have the exact legal effect and, admissib and admissibility as an evidence uh, as, a, as a handwritten signature. So an electronic signature shall not be in denied legal effect and admissibility as evidence in legal proceedings solely on the grounds that it is an electronic form or that it does not meet the requirements for qualified electronic signatures. A qualified electronic signature shall have the equivalent legal effect of a handwritten signature, a qualified electronic signature based on a qualified certificate is issued in one member state shall be recognized as a qualified electronic signature on all other member states. So we'll see what certificates are, we'll see what uh, digital signatures are, that, that's what this talk primarily is about. So at this point, if you don't understand everything that this particular regu regulation, EU regulation says, at least let's keep in mind that electronic signatures are considered valid legal artifacts. We can use 
digital signatures and it will be admissible in court it, it will be considered as a, as a as a legal way of authentication for uh, for documents or Sanjay, just before you move on is it possible sure. somebody's asked if you can just click hide at the bottom of your screen i think it's, ah, it's covering sorry. some of your text that's all wow. thank you i'm so sorry <laughs> thank you yeah yeah thanks thanks for pointing out okay so So what are the requirements for an advanced electronic signature? So an advanced electronic signature shall meet the following requirements. It is uniquely linked to the signatory. It is capable of identifying the signatory. It is created using electronic signature creation data. We'll see what this signature creation data means that the signatory can, with a high level of confidence, use under his or her sole control and it is linked to the data signed therewith in such a way that any subsequent change in the data is de detectable. So for example, if uh, let's think about the, the physical counterpart of this. Uh, I have a document, I have written a letter, for example, uh, by hand, I, I haven't typed it or printed it. And uh, then I sign it at the bottom and then I make some change at the top or I show, uh, I, maybe I show the handwritten letter to somebody and uh, he or she signs it as well, saying that we, okay, we both agree on this handwritten uh, letter or a handwritten contract say, and then I come back home, I make some changes, which of course ha have been done after the, 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 second, the second signatory has actually signed the document. And there's no way for uh, that person to, make a claim that this change was not made before, right? Unless they, they keep a copy or, or something like that. So the signature in this case was actually physically tied to the document, but even then it could be changed. The data within, within the document could be changed, right? So the linking of the data with the signature, that is an important aspect. And any kind of subsequent change in the data should be detectable in case of the, the digital signatures. Okay, now the, the main tool, the main uh, theoretical fundamental concept behind digital signatures is of course, cryptography. Uh, so what, uh, let's, let's start with a quick review of what uh, cryptography is. So it's a scientific study of uh, secure communication in the presence of an adversary. So what does secure mean here? secure has different meanings so one and the most popular meaning of course is confidentiality which means if i'm using cryptography to send a message in a confidential manner then the message will be unintelligible and the mechanism that i'll be using is encryption right so if i send an encrypted message whoever looks at that encrypted message typically called a cipher text whoever looks at that encrypted ciphertext will not be able to figure out anything about that ciphertext. Data integrity. So if a message is being sent, whether encrypted or not, if I'm using some cryptographic method to make sure that the data integrity is maintained, then the data integrity will actually be maintained or the message, the data will actually be unaltered. Right, so that's that's the idea of data integrity. The mechanism, cryptographic mechanism that is used is called hash functions. Authentication, so if I'm using a cryptographic authentication mechanism, then it ensures that the source of the message has not changed. So whoever has, well, the message claims that somebody has actually sent me the message, the cryptography behind uh, such a system will ensure that that is the precise, the sender, the claim sender is actually the real sender of the message. So that's where digital signatures come in for authentication. Non-repudiation, once committed, there's no way to deny it. We saw this in the first slide. Again, digital signatures are used for that. And revocation. So the, the, the users of, of cryptographic systems, they, they typically have some secret information. And using that secret, secret information, they can either decrypt messages or 
or they can sign documents they can they can implement signatures so these these facilities for for uh, decryption for signature or for signing these facilities can be time bounded so after a certain point of time a user will not be able to use that that secret information to decrypt content or after a certain point of time even if the user uses the the secret information to sign a document that will no longer be considered valid so that method of revocation of privilege or retraction of privilege can also be ensured using cryptography so when we say cryptography is the study of secure communication it doesn't only mean encryption it means all these things and more right all these things together and more they they may not always all come together in one system but over a period of time uh, you 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 will be encountering different systems which which employ uh, one or more of these uh, these security properties of of a cryptographic system okay now whenever we are talking about a cryptographic system there are two key ideas here one is called an algorithm the other is called a key right now what is an algorithm an algorithm you can think of an algorithm as computer programs right like a set of instructions that execute on a computing device for example your laptop your mobile your desktop uh, and and any computing device that you can think of a set of instructions which can be executed on that computing device is a computer program and you can think of that as an algorithm right so algorithms when they work they typically work on some kind of data now the data could be so an algorithm would typically take data as input and process the data and give some other data as output right so data fed as input to the algorithm and provided as output by the algorithm right so whenever you think of algorithms they're basically a set of instructions that any computing device your mobile laptops they would be executing these algorithms would take some input and provide some output right so let's let's look at uh, this algorithm here it takes as input input 1 input 2 the algorithm takes as input these two inputs i1 and i2 and provides an output o1 right so this is the output of the algorithm we use this box to denote the algorithm right and then this output o1 can actually be an output to another algorithm algorithm 2 it's a different algorithm a different set of instructions right so let's call so this now becomes an input to this algorithm right algorithm 2 and this algorithm 2 can take some other input say input i4 and it runs using these two inputs and provides the output o2 right so that, that's that's how we work our typical algorithms did they, they take some inputs they process those inputs that's what we denote as execution of that algorithm or execution of that computer program on the device and then it provides some kind of output now there's there's a special kind of input in in any typical cryptographic Uh, algorithm so whenever a cryptographic system is working there would be some cryptographic algorithm which would be working and there's a there's a special kind of input to to a cryptographic algorithm which is called a key now this key it could be a secret key it could be a public key we will see that it's 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 coming but at this point we should keep in mind that a key is nothing but a set of zeros and ones and typically these are randomly generated zeros and ones zeros and ones are called bits so a key is typically a randomly generated set of bits set of zeros and ones for a cryptographic algorithm such a key will be an input to the algorithm and maybe some something else will also be an input to the algorithm and we will get output from that cryptographic algorithm right now with that in mind let's keep let's come to this very fundamental idea that for any cryptographic algorithm the only secret is the secret key the secret input to the cryptographic algorithm is the only secret in the system 
everything else about that system all the algorithms every other data is known right so if if i'm trying to send a secret message to somebody of course the the secret message has to be uh, has to be a secret as well so that's that's not really covered in this statement so i mean to generalize the secret message and the secret key so these are the two secrets and everything else will be known publicly it will be public knowledge so this this has to be kept in mind whenever we are thinking of a cryptographic algorithm a cryptographic algorithm doesn't mean that everything about the system all that is going on in the system is hidden no so the algorithm how exactly uh, my key is getting used that is known only the key itself will not be known only the set of bits the secret that i'll be using to to implement my cryptography that will be that will be the only secret thing everything else the algorithm uh, what kind of system is getting used and everything else is assumed to be known it, it doesn't it doesn't mean that i have to say tell everybody what exactly i'm using but it is assumed that if somebody wants they can come to know what exactly the system is everything other than the key okay so let's move to the first uh, fundamental idea of cryptography which is confidentiality let's assume that alice wants to send a message to bob the message is hyde park 6:30 pm so this is the message that alice wants to send to bob however if alice sends this, this this message in an unencrypted manner so over an insecure channel then there is oscar who is sitting in between who can read this message and neither alice nor bob want that so they don't want oscar to know what the message is in this particular case they, they don't want to uh, they, they don't want oscar to know the place and the time right that alice is telling bob right so what do they do they use a cryptographic system so they use two algorithms here one is the encryption algorithm the other is the decryption algorithm the encryption algorithm takes as input a secret key and the message finds the scrambled message or the cipher text which is denoted as c here and sends that cipher text to bob now for bob to be able to understand this scrambled message so height park 6:30 pm is now scrambled so this is my cipher text so for bob to be able to understand this message bob should know the same key right so the key that was used by alice this is the secret part should be known to bob as well now let us assume that they had met at some earlier point and they had exchanged this key but oscar doesn't know this key so bob can now use this key and the cipher text as input and find using the decryption algorithm find the message and can decrypt it right so the decryption algorithm takes as input the cipher text and the key and decrypts the the original message for you right so oscar here knows what the encryption algorithm is oscar knows what the decryption algorithm is oscar doesn't know the key so oscar cannot find the the cipher text the thing that bob actually can do bob can actually find the cipher text because bob knows the key now a point to be noted here is alice and bob they both shared the same key right so this is called a symmetric key encryption system so in such a system the keys shared by the sender and the receiver are the same so it's a it's it's a shared key between the two however there are other systems other kinds of encryption systems where these two keys can be different right so ks is the secret key kp is a different key and in asymmetric key crypto system this kp is a public key so this this public key would be known to everybody including oscar so in 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 an asymmetric key system the only key that oscar doesn't know or the only component that oscar doesn't know is this 
secret key KS. Of course, it doesn't know this message as well. Otherwise, there's no point in having the encryption system. But this message is dynamically chosen by Alice, right? It is expected that Oscar will not know. But everything else about the system, the encryption algorithm, the decryption algorithm, the public key, all, all of this is public knowledge. Public knowledge meaning Oscar also knows it. So the adversary, in this case, we, we call our adversary Oscar, knows everything about the system other than this secret key. Right? And there are systems where despite this kind of a situation, it is still, it is still secure. And we'll see that. So when we, when we compare a symmetric versus an asymmetric key encryption system, a symmetric key system uses the same secret key KS for encryption and decryption, but for an asymmetric key system, the public key of the recipient is used for encryption and the secret key of the recipient is used for decryption. So this KS is being used, this, this secret key is being used for decryption and the public key is being used for encryption. This is public knowledge. So anybody actually can send a message to Oscar, um, I'm sorry, to Bob by encrypting their own message using this public key and this encryption algorithm, right? Okay, so so that, that's that's more or less the, the distinction between symmetric versus asymmetric encryption systems. Let's, let's move to a second very interesting uh, construct available in cryptography, which is called hash functions. So let's think of a telephone directory. So in, in a telephone directory, the names of the owners of the, tel of the respective numbers, they are all arranged in alphabetical order, right? Alphabetically by, this, by the second name, right? Or by the family name. So in such a system, if I ask you to find a certain person's name, that would be easy, right? Because since it is all al alphabetically arranged, I just have to I just have to go to the respective uh, first letters position. Say, for example, I'm I'm looking for Virginia Franquera. So I I go to the the second names which start with F, and and I I immediately get the name. But if I'm asked to search this same directory for a certain number, this directory is not sorted by numbers, right? So if, I, if I'm asked to search for a certain number, I'll have to go through each and every number to, to figure out whether this is uh, the number that I'm searching for, right? Let's look at an example. So what is the phone number of Jason Nerds? I go to N, I find Jason Nerds here. So this is the phone number. This is easy. But where is this particular number, 079 something? It's, it's very difficult to find in this list. I'll have to go through each and every number to find th this particular number where, where it comes in the list, right? So it appears that it's, it's Rogerio's number, right? So this is hard. So as you can see, if, if you're asked to, if you're asked to do this, I mean, find the mapping from this set to this set, it is easy. If you're asked to find the mapping from this set to the previous one, it is hard, right? So that's the idea behind, uh, behind uh, hash functions. So for a hash function, a hash function is first of all, nothing but a mapping from one set to another, right? It's a function. So it maps each and every element of this set on the left to, to a unique element to the set on the right, right? But it's very hard to find, given an element from the set on the right, it's very hard to find the corresponding element or, or one of the corresponding elements from the, from the previous set, right? From the set on the left. So that's the idea behind the hash function, right? So a hash function takes a long input, but pr produces a fixed length output called a hash. It is easy to compute. So it's easy to go from the left to the right, but it's very hard to invert. So it's very hard to come from the right to the left, 
right? So this left set is a very large set. It's a, the, this is the set of inputs to the hash function. This is the set of outputs to the hash function. So these are all fixed length outputs, say 128 bits, right? Bits are nothing but zeros and ones. So 128 zeros and ones, right? But this could be a very large set, say sentences, as long sentences as you want. So this is a very large set, right? So hash function could be a mapping from this very large set, variable length, very large set. So every, every element here in this set are of varying lengths. So the hash function is a mapping from this very large set to a very small set. And every element in this set has a fixed length, right? So the fact that it is hard to invert means, easy to compute and hard to invert means given an X1, it's very easy to find the corresponding Y1, but given Y1, it's very hard to find the corresponding X1, right? So similarly for, for each and every element on, on this, uh, for, for, for each and every element belonging to the, to the set on the left, the larger set, this is called the domain. Okay, so there are many popular uh, cryptographic hash functions. So this, this kind of uh, hash function is called the cryptographic hash function, which is easy to compute, but it's hard to invert. So there are many uh, cryptographic hash functions. One of the most popular cryptographic hash functions is SHA-256. And uh, let's, let's try this demo for SHA-256. So this is a web service right? Browser link. I'm just using this web service for, for my purposes. What I do is I just, oops, sorry. So I just type some message here. Right? So I just type this message. And if I, if I just press calculate hashes, it, it gives me the different hashes. So these are all different hash functions, right? One of these is SHA-256. So when I type something here and I, I press calculate hashes, it gives me the corresponding hash values for each and every different uh, hashing algorithm that, that this particular service supports. And SHA-256 hash is this value, right? It starts with 0880. Right. Okay. For some reason, it doesn't match here. That shouldn't be the case. Anyway, <clears throat> but what we can do is so if if you keep an if you keep on uh, pressing calculate hash, it it gives the same value. So for a given element, the SHA-256 hash of this particular string is always fixed. It's a deterministic function, right? So it always maps this particular string to this particular uh, set of uh, set of elements, right? Oh, well, to, to this for particular string. Now let's try changing this string. So from wisdom is nowhere, let's make wisdom is now here. This is a very small change, right? And if I try to calculate the hash, it changes drastically, right? So it changes drastically. So nowhere it is 0, 8, 8, 0, 1, 8, and so on. I just enter a space in between and it changes drastically. Right? So that's the point which I wanted to point it out. So a slight change in the input completely changes the hash value. Now this is very useful for implementing integrity checks. So if I store the hash value of something, I can be rest assured that the, the data for which the hash was computed, if it changes even by a very small amount, the actual hash value will change, right? So if I have my data stored somewhere and I, I, key, I compute its hash value, I store that hash value somewhere else. I come back after 10 days and I compute the hash value again. 
if it matches with my previously stored hash value, then the data has not been changed, right? So that is how the, the integrity of the data is ensured, right? So hash functions are one of the most uh, used. They're a very powerful tool in cryptography. They're used in, in different ways in, within cryptography. And one of the main uses of hash functions is in, in determining the integrity of the data or for integrity check of the data, right? So with this in mind, let's go ahead. So let's, let's revisit a public key encryption system with some more details. Now, as before, we have Alice, who, who is the sender. We have an adversary of this public key encryption system. We call it PKE adversary. And we have Bob, who is the recipient of the data, right? So what Bob will do is, once the public key encryption system has been established, there is a setup algorithm which is available to Bob. Bob runs this setup algorithm to generate some public parameters. Again, these are things, these are numbers, these are elements which are public. So everybody would be knowing these public parameters. And along with the public parameters, it gets a public key, KP and a secret key KS. So that's what the setup algorithm does. The setup algorithm gives as output some public parameters, a public key and a secret key. So this setup algorithm is run by Bob. Bob keeps these values with himself. However, the public part, the public parameters and the public key is shared with everybody say on a public platform, on a public forum. Say Bob has a website, Bob publishes this public parameter and the public key on that website, right? So we can assume that whoever wants to send a message to Bob, say Alice wants to send a message to Bob, Alice would have these public parameters and the public key. And similarly would any other adverts, say any adversary, anybody who is trying to behave adversarially would also have this information, right? Now, if Alice wants to send a message, Alice selects that message M, it computes, Alice computes the encryption of that message using that public key and the public parameters. So the public key and the public parameters, they are used by Alice for encrypting a certain message. Say so C is the ciphertext that is created through, through that encryption. That encryption, that encrypted form of the message, which is the ciphertext, it is sent to the recipient Bob. Now Bob knows the secret key, right? So the secret key is only known to Bob. So Bob can actually decrypt that particular message and find it. However, since the adversary doesn't have the secret key, it cannot find the message. So the adversary can try to find the, the secret key itself or the message, uh, sorry, the message itself or the secret key through which it can learn the message, it can, it can keep on trying, but that's the cryptographic guarantee that given such a system, unless the, the, the adversary knows the secret key, the adversary will not be able to find either the secret key or the message with any considerable probability. So with a very negligible probability, there is always a chance that the adversary will chance upon the correct secret key, but that's very unlikely. Right. So that's the typical uh, uh, encryption system. Now that brings us to the main topic of our, our discussion today, which is digital signatures. So this precise system can be just reversed to get a digital signature system. Right. So this, this is exactly the same setup, the same system with a, a small tweak can be used as a digital signature system. So we again use the same setup here. Again, Bob is the person who will be holding the, the secret key. We have an adversary, we have Alice. So in a digital signature system, it is, the role is kind of reversed. So the person who is actually holding the secret key is the person who is going to sign 
So the, the capability of sig signing a certain uh, data or a document lies with the person who is who has the secret key. So in case of encryption algorithm, the person holding the secret key is the one who is able to decrypt the data. Here, the person holding the secret key has the capability to sign that data, right? So again, as before, Bob runs a setup here along with the public parameters the public key and the secret key an additional hash function is generated mind you that the the kind of authentication that we are expecting from digital signatures it has two 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 aspects one is the data authentication the other is the is the source or the identity authentication right so for the data data authentication or the integrity check of the data the hash function part comes in so the hash function thing is important here because as i explained before the the integrity check is is required here so the hash function plays a key role in in ensuring that integrity check the rest of it is very similar so it uh, bob runs this setup finds these uh, these elements receives it and then shares all the public information so typically the, the hash function and the public key may or may not be considered as part of the, the public parameters. It's, it depends on convention, but uh, the overall idea is that the only secret that lies with uh, Bob is the, the secret key and everything else is made public. So everybody knows it, right? Now, if Bob wants to sign a certain message M, what would Bob do? Bob would first find the hash of that message, let's call it H, and it, it signs this hash using its secret key, right? And let's call the signature, which is output of the signing algorithm. So this, this is uh, analogous to, to, the, to the decryption algorithm there in the, in the encryption system. So think of this as the decryption algorithm. It takes as input the, the secret key and the hash value and finds the signature. Right. This this message and signature pair is sent to Alice, who is going to verify if Bob is the actual signer of this particular message. Mind you, the message here is not encrypted. We could have encrypted it. That would be a sign, sign encryption system or, or a sign then uh, encrypt or encrypt then sign. So that's a that's a different kind of system here. I'm assuming that this message is not encrypted. Right, it's it's just a plain text message. I just have, or or Bob in this case have has just signed that message, right, and and sent it across. Now the moment Alice, who who is now the verifier, receives this uh, this particular message, for it for uh, Alice first computes the hash of it, right, then runs this verify algorithm, so using uh, the signature and the public key and the public parameters finds the hash that is output by this verify algorithm and then checks if this these two hashes so the hash computed from the message directly and the hash computed from the signature if these two match right so these are the two components the the message and the signature which was sent by bob all that alice has to do is check if the hash of this message and the hash value that is found from the signature if they match in case they match, then it's a valid signature. If they, if they don't match, then it's an invalid signature, right? And as I mentioned before, in, in many cases, in many uh, encryption algorithms, the encryption algorithm itself can be just reversed to, to be used as a digital signature algorithm, right? So, so that's the overall idea. So two, two, uh, two elements are sent by the signer, the message itself and an associated signature. So when, when the verifier receives the, the message and the signature, the verifier computes the hash out of the message and finds the hash from the signature and just tries to match the two. In case these two match, uh, it's a valid signature, right? So the adversary can, of course, since the adversary has the message, the adversary can see the message as well as the signature. This is an insecure channel that is being used to send these two. The adversary can see the message. I'm assuming that it's not encrypted, so it can see the message. So from that message, it, it can of course compute the hash, 
but it cannot make any changes to this message so that it will still be verified here, right? So it cannot change the message such that it will still get verified properly because the corresponding signature cannot be generated by the adversary since it does not have the secret key. So that's the key idea here. So the adversary can of course change, change the message. In this case, uh, Alice, the, these two will not match and Alice will know that this message was not sent by Bob, right? So adversary can as well interrupt uh, and, and change the message, but then Alice will know that this message was not from Bob, right? So, and, and in case the, the adversary actually changes the message, the adversary cannot successfully generate the corresponding signature because the adversary does not have the secret key, right? So that is, that is the crux here. This public key and the secret key, they are a pair, right? They are, they are, they are complementary to each other. So for a certain secret key, only a certain public key will work. Not any random public key will work, right? And hence, during the setup, this public key and the secret key, they were generated as a pair and they have to be used as a pair as well. So if I sign with a certain uh, secret key, it can only get verified with the corresponding public key and, and not any other public key. Or if I sign with a different uh, secret key that then it cannot get verified by this initial public key that was generated, right? So that's, that's, the, the, that's the key idea. And, and this, the fact that the adversary cannot guess or or will even if the adversary guesses this secret key it will be very negligible in terms of the probability of success of guessing this secret key that is ensured by cryptography think about a very large set and uh, and trying to guess say say numbers between 1 and say 100 million and this this secret key is any one of those numbers between one and 100 million. Now the probability that the adversary guesses that particular, that certain number which is getting used, that probability is very less. There is still a, a, a probability, but it's negligible, right? So that's the cryptographic idea behind, behind this whole, uh, whole system of uh, a digital signature algorithm, right? The fact that, this secret key cannot be guessed, right? Cannot be guessed easily. There's another associated idea, which is uh, computational hardness, which I'm not going into in, in this particular case. That, that is a little more involved, but the overall idea is the, the adversary, the system that is that will be used, a, a, a cryptographically secure digital signature uh, scheme, if, if that gets used, then it is, very, very, very unlikely that any adversary will be able to forge the signature, right? So the forgery, the chances of forgery are negligible, right? Okay, now uh, trying, to, trying to wrap things up uh, around cryptography here a bit. So the same system can be used as a a public key encryption system or a digital signature system, right? So in case of a public key encryption system, the public key is used for encryption and the secret key is used for decryption for, I'm sorry, for a digital signature system, the secret key is used for signing and the public key is used for verification, right? So the same system, can be not not every uh, public key encryption system can directly be used as a digital signature system, but many many systems many such systems can be right. Okay. Now that that brings us to a final discussion around the cryptographic ideas that we have. which is <clears throat> traditionally called the woman or the man in the middle attack. So what does that mean? Now remember that Bob is the one 
who who is holding the secret key and bob is the one who is running the setup algorithm right and bob is publishing this this uh, set of public information the public parameters the hash function the the public key bob is the one who is publishing it now the adversary can be assumed to be quite powerful right so it it can have control over the network its resources and stuff like that so what the adversary can do is if the adversary receives uh, the public key the adversary can as, as well stop this particular message from going to alice and just replace the public key with uh, with uh, its own public key the adversary's own public key right so uh, say the kp kp is uh, uh, bob's public key it, it it the adversary replaces that with kp prime it's it's a different number it's it's a different public key right sanjay we've had a question through asking if there's a problem if bob doesn't hash the message before signing it uh sorry uh is there a problem if bob doesn't hash the message before signing it well it depends uh in 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 certain contexts yes uh it it could be a problem uh but but in general i i don't see a, a a specific problem that i can talk about immediately okay that was a, a question from sabati uh, i don't know if there's a follow up question at all there sure so uh, let let's take this up uh, in the end during the discussion so maybe okay. i'll have to ask specifically what what she is asking okay right okay okay thank you so <clears throat> now okay so what what uh, the adversary can do is replace the public key of bob and pretend impersonate bob that yes i am bob and my my uh, public key is kp prime right so so what what can what can the adversary achieve with this so if if the public key is replaced then the corresponding secret key is not owned by bob right because bob's public key is kp and that has now been replaced so if now alice encrypts a message using kp prime that of course cannot be decrypted by bob but the adversary who has created this particular public key has the corresponding secret key so the adversary will be able to decrypt it similarly for signature if this adversary signs a uh, a message using kp prime using this particular public key then it will get verified using the public key by alice so both for encryption and for signature if alice gets convinced that yes this is uh, bob's public key then bob i mean bob can be impersonated when when uh, at the time of signatures and the information that alice encrypts using this particular public key and sends it to bob that can actually be decrypted by by the adversary eve right so that's the idea so this this fact that the 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 public key itself got replaced can be used to attack the system such that the the owner of the original secret key will neither be able to decrypt it nor be able to uh, nor be able to well i mean the the owner of the original secret key will actually be impersonated if required right so that's that's the idea of the woman in the middle attack so how can this particular attack be be stopped how can this the fact that uh, anybody can replace my public key on a public domain and try and can convince someone else that uh, uh a spurious public key is actually my public key so how can how can that be handled so let's think about that uh, for a moment uh so the fact that i generated a public key i i published it on some on some uh, uh on some public forum that does not bind that particular public key with me so my identity has to be in some way bound 
to to the public key that that is being sent right so my public key and my identity have to be bound together have to be put together and then sent to alice so that alice knows that this particular public key is actually my public key or say bob's public key right so this binding is important for for uh, for us to avoid this woman in the middle attack right and that can be achieved by a centralized system uh, that we will be talking about so which is called a certifying authority right so if if you remember from the initial discussions from the eu regulation there there has to be a, an authority who who ratifies that a particular signature is valid so that is the certifying authority right we'll come back to that discussion when we go to the to, to the legal aspects again so when can alice trust that a particular public key is indeed from bob right so so there is a certifying authority and uh, there are not many certifying authorities on this world maybe around say 200 so this is not so th these are all very known or very very well known and credible organizations in most cases right so some of the certifying authorities are definitely quite credible so their their public keys are very well known right so it's not like i mean uh, uh, a random person whose uh, whose public key may not be very well known this is a, a certifying authority whose public key is very well known say for example if i if i have bought a, a a computer with a certain operating system say windows on it then the browser that i'll be using say for example internet explorer or edge that browser has the the public keys for most of these uh, certifying authorities right so it is it is that well known so the the certifying authorities public keys are well known so there is no scope for for man in the middle middle attack in terms of the certifying authorities public key being impersonated by someone else right so let's start from there so again now bob again bob is a is a, is a bob is a normal user of the internet Bob is not a certifying authority. Uh, so Bob generates uh, this, this key pair, the public key and the secret key pair. And Bob, Bob wants to associate the public key along with the identity. Now remember that the problem with, with uh, the, I mean, the problem which transferred into the woman in the middle attack is the fact that my public key was not bound to my identity, right? So that's what Bob needs to do. Bob sends this pair, the public key and his identity to the certifying authority. The certifying authority first does some identity verification of Bob. So checks that whether Bob is indeed Bob who claims that he is Bob, right? And Bob is indeed Bob. Bob is not Charles or Bob, Bob is not Sanjay. So, so the certifying authority does this check, this identity verification, right? That is, is in most cases physical verification, right? Uh, very difficult to say what exactly is happening in COVID-19 times, but this is uh, a very strong checking that the certifying authority has to do. Because for this binding to be true, Bob has to be the real person, right? So hence this, this verification of identity, this, this particular point, is a very important point. Once the certifying authority is convinced that yes, uh, this is indeed Bob, then the public key which was generated by Bob, mind you, so this, this public key uh, secret key pair was generated by Bob. So that will now be signed by the certifying authority with its own secret key. Now this is a secret key that is owned only by the certifying authority. Let's assume that it's just one entity, right? So, uh, so this this particular certifying authority has a secret key, and it uses that secret key to to uh, sign the the ID this 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 pair that it has received from Bob, and this is the signature of of the certifying authority, and this signature, along with the the identity that was sent, the signature that was just generated by the certifying authority, and the identity pair that was initially sent by Bob. This pair together becomes 
the certificate for Bob. So this is a certificate that has now been created by the certifying authority for Bob, right? So Bob sent his identity pair, which is say some identity document along with the public key that Bob had generated. It, uh, the certifying authority receives it, does the checking whether it's, it's actually Bob or not, signs the identity pair, which is the public key with Bob's identity and generates the certificate. There are two main components of the certificate, the identity pair and the signature. Now this signature, mind you, can only be generated by, by the certifying authority such that it will be, or it can be validated using the certifying authority's uh, public key. So only this public key will validate this signature. No other public key can validate the signature, right? And this public key is well known, right? Now, once uh, the certifying authority has generated the certificate, it sends that certificate to Bob, right? Well, uh, Alice could uh, ask the certifying authority to send the, the, to send Bob's certificate to Alice directly as well. Anyway, so once Bob receives this certificate, Bob sends this certificate to Alice, right? So now, when Alice looks at this certificate, Alice can verify that yes, the content of the certificate has a public key and the certifying authority has signed this particular public key and Bob's identity, that pair, with its own uh, secret key. So it has signed, it, there, there is a signature which says that yes, this is a valid pair. So the signature from the certifying authority that is carried by the certificate establishes the fact that yes, this pair is indeed a valid pair, right? The, the identity pair of the public key and the identity of Bob, this is a valid pair, right? So that's the role of the certifying authority to establish that a certain public key and identity pair is a valid pair, right? Now, once that has happened, the rest is pretty, pretty easy to think about. So once Alice receives it, uh, since the, the public key is well known, so it's, it's very unlikely that there can be a woman in the middle attack based on this particular public key. Now, if the verification of uh, this particular, uh, particular certificate, it is successful, then Alice has received, received the correct public key through the certificate, right? Now that Alice is sure that the pub, so PK Bob is indeed Bob's public key, when Alice receives a message from Bob at a later point of time, then, so, so this, this particular message has a, a, an unencrypted message, say, and a signature which has been signed using the secret key for PK Bob. So this is basically Bob's signature. Then Alice can verify this particular signature and message pair using PK Bob, which now Alice is convinced is indeed Bob's public key. So the, the whole idea of replacing the public key is, is now gone because now Alice has received the assurance through the certificate that yes, it is indeed Bob's public key. So the problem of, of uh, impersonation is gone, right? <coughs> okay, so similarly, when Alice sends a ciphertext C, encrypting it using PK Bob, Alice is sure that yes, this particular encryption using the public key of Bob can only be decrypted by Bob and not someone else, right? So let's think about the trust factors in this particular system. So the fact that Alice is trusting the certificate actually means that Alice is actually trusting the cert certifying authority or, or the public key of the certifying authority. The fact that Alice is using the certifying authority's public key to do the verification, that actually shows that Alice is trusting that particular public key of the certifying authority, right? Which then translates into the trust on the public key of Bob, right? So there is a transitivity of trust here. So Alice trusts the public key of the certifying authority and then using the certificate that it has Alice has received, Alice then trusts the public key of Bob, which 
uh, Alice has extracted from that particular certificate, right? So there is, of course, a protocol, uh, the X.509 uh, protocol for uh, digital certificates. So when Bob sends a certificate to Alice, there has to be an agreed standard format. This is, so X.509 is that standard format. There are some other formats as well, but this is the most commonly used certificate format, right? It's used in TLS SSL. TLS is transport, transport layered security. So this is used in uh, in web browsers. It's used in email protocols. It's used it's used almost in every kind of uh, communication uh, network security application. So so this uh, the TLS SSL uh, SSL is now defunct. So TLS is the uh, the protocol which gets used and it uses the 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 X.509 certificates for establishing trust on the network. Then uh, the X.509 standard is used in smart cards. It's used in TPMs, which are basically secure crypto processor hardware with integrated cryptography keys. It's used in Microsoft Authenticode. This is a way of, uh, a way in which Microsoft says that a certain code has been actually sent by Microsoft. It's not someone else pretending to be Microsoft who is sending that particular code, right? So M Microsoft has that system called Authenticode and it uses the same X.509 certificate. It's used in cable TV communication, open, open cable security standards. They use the same X.509 uh, certificate system. It's used in IPsec for authenticating peers in VPNs. Um, uh, VPNs are virtual private networks the secure networks, which we typically use, uh, especially when we are uh, working with, uh, working remotely with, with our university or, or any organization that requires a trusted uh, secure network. So IPsec is, is the protocol that is used there. And that again, uses the X.509 certificate. So overall, the, the trust in, in a network is established through digital signatures, right? And that in, a, in, in uh, an electronic network system is used, uh, I'm sorry, is established using digital signatures and X.509 is the most popular standard for achieving that. So the typical structure of X.509, uh, it has many different fields, but uh, the key fields that we should look at now is there is a validity period. So every signature, every digital signature is valid for a certain period of time. It's not valid before that period, it's not valid after that period, right? So there is only a certain validity period for, for every uh, digital certificate. Of course, after, after the, uh, that period, after the certificate expires, we can always verify if uh, it was valid at a certain point of time, that can be done. Now, what does the certificate contain? Mind you, that this is the certificate, right? I was saying that it has this pair. It, it, it basically binds the public key with the identity of the person, right? Or, or of, the, of the institution. So subject name is one of the things in the digital certificate, which is basically the owner of the certificate, Bob, for example. And here is the public key information. So these two are the two key fields of, of the digital uh, certificate. X.509 standard. Uh, the, the public key information, of course, includes the public key algorithm, which will be used, and, and the, the subjects or the owners public key itself, right? And all of this information together, right, is then signed by the certificate signature, which is basically the, the certifying authority will sign all of these together. So when I was explaining here, I was just saying that this pair is signed. It's actually this pair and some more information that's all put together in the certificate and then signed by the certifying authority, right? So all of this together is signed by the certifying authority by using its, its own secret key, right? So as you can imagine, the certificate management is a uh, is a challenging task. So 
for any any certifying authority managing all these certificates for for different uh, individuals organizations that's that's not always easy right that there are certain key points uh, which we have already touched upon before so certificates can expire and and one one key reason behind that is a fail safe option for example if i have a certificate which i have received from a certifying authority that certificate has been generated based on the public key that i had sent right now i i have the the secret key the secret key's responsibility is typically not of the of the certifying authority now say i lose the secret key and then what happens so there has to be fail safe options right so there has to be a provision to revoke certificates so if i report to the certifying authority saying that the, uh, my uh, my secret key for my certificate which i had initially received maybe in exchange for some amount of money some payment that i have made to the certifying authority so the certificate which i had received i have lost the corresponding secret key and what should i do then so then the certifying authority will revoke my certificate so that it cannot be misused by someone else who comes across my secret key in some way or the other right so that is that 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 might be one reason for for certificate revocation of course with a, a certificate is valid for a certain period of time if the validity expires then of course the the certificate has to be revoked or or it 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 is expired it's not revoked it's expired actually so and we, we've had a we've had a question through is it possible to somehow reduce the trust on the certifying authority yes yes yeah so there are there are distributed uh, uh there are distributed systems uh, who that can be used as as certification systems and then there are uh, there are peer to peer uh, self certifying systems so i certify myself uh, and and there are such uh, it it is called a web of web of trust that can be established using uh, using some some self certifying system so yes there are there are ways of doing that of tr not really trusting uh, systems so blockchain based alternatives out there uh, to uh, to this certifying authority uh, problem let's call it centralization problem so there are alternatives yes anything else marcus uh no that's it thank you okay okay so alice needs to know if uh, a certifying uh, sorry if bob certificate is indeed fresh right so if if it has expired or not so there are ways of doing that so online certificate status protocol ocsp is one way of of establishing whether uh, a certificate is uh, is fresh whether it is it is still not expired whether it is valid within the period that it is supposed to be certificate revocation list uh, crl uh, is another way so the revoked certificates are published by by the certifying authority uh, and that can be checked if the certificate has been revoked then there are one way hash chains using which certificates the the secret keys can be adapted over a period of time and so on right so uh, we have been speaking about certifying authorities evidently if we if we plan to use uh, digital signatures we would uh, we would want we would typically want to get a certificate uh, from one of these certifying authorities unless we are using other alternatives so these are some of the currently well i've i've got this from wikipedia so the, this this i mean the, the authenticity of this has to, well the, the validity of this has to be checked how correct this is has to be checked but well this gives an overall idea about the kind of uh, people who are playing in this field ident trust and uh, digicert are two of the largest uh, let's encrypt is a very interesting uh, Uh, certifying authority it it certifies uh, people for free so that's and and uh, I, as far as i remember they uh, i mean they ha they have very strong uh, support for uh, open source systems so yeah so that that's that's a very interesting alternative yeah so these are uh, the certifying authorities 
that we have. So the overall summary here, I think, uh, yeah, we don't have much time. So, uh, I mean, if, if we summarize it in, in terms of the cryptology that we have spoken about today, there are two main aspects that we looked at, encryption and signatures. So encryption is used for confidentiality, signature is, for, is used for authentication. Uh, the most commonly used system is RSA, Rivest Shamir Edelman, which, uh, which was one of the first, it was in fact, uh, yeah, so one of the first uh, systems in public key cryptography and uh, uh, it can be used both for, for encryption as well as signature. Then we have ellip elliptic curve digital signature algorithm that uh, has its own benefits of uh, reduced key size and increased, uh, correspondingly increased uh, security levels that it provides. So encryption and signatures, and signatures typically involve hash functions. Uh, there is, there is a, a whole and a very important aspect of crypto, which is symmetric key crypto, which I didn't mention in this talk almost at all, other than the overall uh, framework in which it works, where the key, the same key is shared between the sender and the receiver or, or the communicating parties. So uh, that that have not even spoken about. So, but I just wanted to mention that that's one of the one of the key aspects of, of cryptography in use. Okay, now let's get 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 back to our topic, which is handwritten signatures, right? Mm -hmm. So, order for forgery. Now let's compare, now, now that we have understood uh, digital signatures to some extent, let's compare it with handwritten signatures, right? So the properties of handwritten signatures do not always necessarily translate to the digital world, right? For example, if we think of the physical form or the form, then the handwritten signature is nothing but a physical object, right? Whereas the digital signature is an electronic data, right? Bits, for example. So this can be easily copied and be still valid. This, if copied, it reduces in value, right? The signer, in case of handwritten signatures, is a human being. In case of digital signatures, it's a combination of humans, groups, devices, software processes, and so on, right? And, and this part of the comparison, I've, I've referred to the, the very nice book uh, by Keith Martin. It's called Everyday Cryptography. I think it came out in 2017. So along with the mathematical fundamentals, it, it gives a very nice overview of, of the practical aspects of implementing cryptography. So uh, the next aspect, when we think about the comparison between handwritten signatures and digital signatures is the uniqueness to individuals, right? So handwritten signatures is biometrically controlled. So it's unique to a signer, right? Uh, as I um, had mentioned in the beginning of uh, this, this webinar, it may look similar to an untrained eye, but experts can fairly accurately distinguish. The problem lies with the fact that it may look similar to an untrained eye, right? So that's, that's where all the problems come in. If, if we can always get an expert to authenticate an individual based on their signature, that, that would be a very, very good way of authenticating somebody, but that's not always possible. In case of digital signatures, they, they depend on the signing key and the data that we have already spoken about. Now it's unique for a single message and a pair. Now this is very important. So digital signatures, even if I'm using the same key, it is crucial that for every different message, the, the signature, the value, the, the signature generated is different. If it is the same in case of uh, uh, each, for every every different message, if the digital signature is the same, that 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 signature can just be used, can be copied and used, right? So so it's very crucial that in case of digital signatures, okay, let's take an example. Say there are two documents, document A and document B. I I sign document A. I generate a signature. If if my signing of document B generates the same signature then the first signature could as well be copied by someone else who has received that first signature. And that person can claim that, yes, the first signature is actually the signature for the second document as well, right? Which is, which is incorrect and which, which will be wrong to do. 
So the system requires, it's crucial for digital signatures that the, the signatures vary with messages, even for the same key, right? So it's crucial uh, that the signatures vary. It's extremely unlikely that two individuals will generate the same key, right? Signature creation, this requires presence of a signer to create a handwritten signature, but for a digital signature, it requires a secure equipment or infrastructure. Why, why is the equipment required to be secure? Because the equipment will be using the secret key. Now, if the equipment itself is not secure, then that secret key might get leaked, right? Defeating the whole system. Availability, so can, so uh, in case of uh, handwritten signatures, they can always be generated by the signer. So whenever the person is physically available, unless they are ill or there's some other kind of problem, they can always generate uh, the sign, right? Uh, in case of digital signature, of course, we need an infrastructure, computing systems, the signature key storage devices. So there are smart cards uh, and other kind of uh, uh, signing signing equipments, which can be which are available, so which can be used for for generating digital signatures for storing the keys in a secure manner and then using those keys for generating signatures. So I would typically not want my, my uh, signing key, my digital signing key to be stored in my laptop because if somebody hacks into my system, they would, uh, they would easily get my signing key. So I would always want to store the signing key in, in some other device which is not connected to the internet, always, for example. Only when I need to sign, uh, a particular document, I, I take that uh, physical system, I, I use it, and then I keep it away again. Forgeability, so in case of handwritten signatures, they're easily forgeable superficially. <clears throat> Some common methods are tracing paper based techniques, free handing, I don't think I, I should be elaborating any more on this, but yeah, I mean, we can, we can always guess that there, there can be very easy ways of uh, superficially forging. Of course, th they would still be detectable to experts, but uh, for a naive eye <coughs> or for a, uh, for somebody who is not an expert in in uh, detecting uh, forgery of handwritten signatures, it, it, it will be very difficult. It can be very difficult to detect if uh, a signature is forged or not. So it may fool most people most of the time. And that's where the problem lies. That's where the problem lies that with hand, handwritten signatures or their substitutes, it's, it's very easy to fool most people most of the time. If not very easy, it, it's, it's, it's mostly easy to fool most people most of the time. And that's the problem. It's hard to forge in a way that will be undetectable to experts. So that's still a very good thing. In case of digital signatures, precisely verifiable by the verification algorithm with a key. So unless, uh, somebody has the key, oh, sorry, uh, so this is the public key. So for anybody who has the public key, they can easily verify using the verification algorithm. The verification uh, key is a public key once again. So it can, I mean, anybody or, and everybody has the public key, they can check the validity of, of that public key using the certificate and uh, then they can easily verify if a certain digital signature is, uh, is valid or not. It's very hard to forge if the infrastructure is secure. It's easy to forge if the infrastructure is insecure. So secret uh, signing key, if, if it gets leaked, it's easy to forge. Integrity, uh, handwritten signatures. So this I mentioned already before. So the, the physical document on which I sign, I, I do my hand, hand, handwritten signature. So that can, be, that can be edited, right? So that can be changed, the data which I signed can be changed at, at a later point after me signing it, right? So the, uh, so that's one aspect. The other aspect is, so if, if it's a multiple page document, then typically what we do is sign the last page or maybe the first page. We don't sign all pages all the time. In, in many, many occasions we do, but if we are just signing the last page or the first page, we kind of trust the person whom we hand over the document that they will not they will not uh, change the intermediate pages that we have not signed. So that's that's a problem. Uh, 
in case of digital signatures, of course, uh, it depends on the message and the secret key. So it authenticates the origin of the data and assures its integrity. So the integrity of data is, is by design, uh, it's assured by a digital signature scheme. So consistency over messages, so uh, handwritten signatures, they're approximately the same for every message every time. In case of digital signatures, they're cru crucially message dependent. They are definitely different all the time with very high probability. Now, consistency over time, so handwritten signatures approximately the same for every message every time. Uh, for in case of digital signatures, it's always the same for the same inputs. So digital signature algorithms are deterministic algorithms for a given input and a key. And maybe some, some randomness. The precise verification, uh, the handwritten signature, the diffi uh, it's, it's for in case of handwritten signatures, it's difficult for untrained eyes. Experts need prior samples to be able to verify if a certain signature belongs to a certain person. In case of digital signatures, it, it's precisely verifiable by the verification algorithm with a key. The level of security in case of handwritten signatures, it's not relevant. Levels of checking can be different depending upon the signature being witnessed or notarized in case of digital signatures, more secure for longer keys. So the level of security can be increased if the length of the keys is larger, right? So it can be more secure. It can be made more secure by choosing larger keys. Of course, the corresponding computation time, uh, so efficiency in both in terms of the key size as well as the computation time will go up or efficiency will become worse. There's a human computer gap. So pages of a document are not signed. The pages of a document which are not signed, they can be replaced. In case of digital signatures, the computing components and the infrastructure has to be trusted. So the human may later claim that she never created a signature. So if, if I'm not, well, it's very hard to be, uh, to be an expert in everything that goes on when a digital signature is being done, right? So I can always claim that this, this signature happened by some means that I'm not aware of, which has happened within the computer. That's a problem uh, of the human computer gap, which can end up being uh, a strong argument in, in a legal setup. For cost, hand, handwritten signatures are very cheap. <clears throat> Verification by an expert, of course, can be costly. In case of digital signature, the infrastructure is costly. The technology, the key management, etc., involves a lot of cost. In terms of longevity, uh, handwritten signatures, uh, they can last for a lifetime unless, of course, they are destroyed. However, copies are inherently less authentic. Right, and hence they are not always admissible. In case of digital signatures, they are valid as long as the key pairs are valid. They can be renewed. They can be checked for predated validity. They can be easily copied and hence may not easily be destroyed. Physical binding with the data. So in case of handwritten signatures, it's bound physically only to the pages signed. In case of digital signatures, we can store the actual digital signature portion away from the data. So the digital signature can be stored somewhere else. The, the data that is being signed that can be stored physically somewhere else. Multiple signatures, in case of handwritten signatures, limited number of signatures per individual can exist. So if I have different varieties of signatures, I can have say five, 10, 20, at most varieties of signatures that are used in different contexts. In, in case of digital signatures, it's practically unlimited because I can keep on generating as many public key, private key pairs, and I can get them certified from a certifying authority. So the number of, so in terms of uh, multiplicity of signatures, of course, in case of digital signatures, there are much more possibilities than in case of handwritten signatures. Uh, Okay, I don't think we have too much time. 
So let's uh, skip this part. So there are different varieties uh, of uh, digital signatures, each with their own unique applications. Let's skip these parts. Uh, let's quickly go through the laws and validity once again of electronic signatures. So what amounts as a valid digital signature? So according to the EU resolution, the certificate, and now when we read this, I think we will understand what a certificate means, right? What a qualified certificate means. So the certificate that supports the signature was at the time of signing a qualified certificate for electronic signature complying with some more details in Annex 1. The qualified certificate was issued by a qualified trust service provider. So in, in this case, it could be a certifying authority and was valid at the time of signing. The signature validation data corresponds to the data provided by the relying party. The unique set of data representing the signatory in a certificate is currently provided by the relying party. The use of a pseudonym is clearly indicated to the relying party if a pseudonym was used at the time of signing. The electronic signature was created by a qualified electronic signature creating device. So which means a device that can store the keys securely or can access the keys which are stored somewhere else securely. The integrity of the signed data has not been compromised. The requirements provided in Article 26 were met at the time of the signing. So Article 26 provides some more uh, crucial requirements. So all this, this uh, the EU resolution, and there are several others, there are several other laws which are prevalent internationally. So it kind of triggered from, from this model law from the United Nations. So the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law, it formulated a model law on e-commerce in 1996, and th that was adopted by the General Assembly Resolution in 1996. So it recommends that all states give favor favorable uh, consideration to the model law when they enact or revise their laws in view of the need for uniformity of the law applicable to alternatives to paper-based methods for communication and storage of information. So this kind of gave a push and the, the EU resolution actually enabled cross-border uh, signature or, or ratification or uh, authentication of documents, right? So it was very beneficial. It was in fact essential for, for e-commerce to be established across borders. So the US again has its own uh, set of laws which actually recognizes uh, digital signatures as a valid form of signature. In, uh, we have, in India, we have uh, the Indian IT Act, which actually provides for the creation and management of the pu public key infrastructure in India, which means the certifying authorities who will be dealing with uh, the certificates in Canada, in China, in Australia, and again, in, in in many countries, I think if I remember correctly, there are around 65 or 70 countries which have defined, well-defined uh, norms and standards and regulations and, and laws for dealing with, uh, with digital signatures. Now, the most important part I think for today's talk is this one, which is the tools which are available other than the us usual browser, uh, browser-based tools that we have for digital signatures. So uh, let me start with OpenPGP, which is basically an open standard for encrypted messages, signatures, and certificates for exchanging public keys. They're defined by the OpenPGP working group of the Internet Engineering Task Force. They're available on Windows, Mac OS, Mac OS, uh, GNU, Linux, Android, and iOS. It's so for this particular standard. OpenPGP standard, the open source software has been provided, which is basically GNU Privacy Guard. And the OpenPGP website claims to be secure from intelligence organizations. So, so in my opinion, this is one of the most uh, secure systems uh, that one can use for encryption, for, for signature, and so on. And the, the open source uh, software, which is provided by the by OpenPGP standards, is is a complete uh, is GNU Privacy Guard or GPG. It's a complete 
and free implementation of the of the standard open pgp standard it allows for generation of public and private key pairs it allows performing message signing encryption and decryption there is a windows uh, version which is called gpg for win uh, and and it can actually be integrated with with outlook microsoft uh, has uh, several options of integrating uh, digital signatures to its uh, to its uh, different tools to its different software outlook and excel they support uh, the use of digital uh, certificates and encryption signatures so you can configure outlook you can configure excel to use your digital certificate so if you if you get a digital certificate from a certifying authority it might, the uh, outlook and excel can be configured to use that particular certificate for for signing your documents whenever you want to so that's 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 uh, that's useful, I think. It supports uh, multiple certificates for signatures, so I can have uh, several uh, certificates uh, that I have received from different or maybe the same certifying authority. I can I can plug them all in to to Outlook and Excel, and encryption by the uh, and and that can be used for for signature as well as encryption. The certificates have to be from CAs, this, so Microsoft doesn't provide the certificates themselves. So the certi so we'll have to get the certificates from the certifying authorities, but we can integrate them in Microsoft Outlook. We can integrate them in Excel to, to be used for, for encryption or, or signature. Uh, and so it, on, on the Microsoft website, they suggest global sign and I don't trust. These are two very popular. Uh, so I don't trust is the, has the largest market share in terms of, uh, in terms of the, the business that exists around uh, digital signatures and certificate authorities. So th there are pri private uh, web-based services uh, for, for digital signatures. So some claims that they make in particular, Global Sign uh, has these claims on, on their website. So they meet the industry and the regulatory compliance standards they save time and money over wet wet ink signatures multiple signing identity options are, are available with them it's pki based digital signatures they offer high <clears throat> they offer higher assurance than <clears throat> handwritten signatures uh, scalable deployments and integrations with other software time stamping is included of course and then there are two lists of uh, credible uh, certifying authorities one from adobe the other from uh, microsoft which you can check to to uh, to know more about which which certifying authority would be trusted a very key application of digital signatures is in bitcoins so bitcoin uh, is a distributed and decentralized uh, currency system so in in case of bitcoins uh, you can own a bitcoin by that Bitcoin being associated with a certain public key, right? It's exactly the same digital signature algorithms that we are talking about, which get used in, in Bitcoins. So a transaction in a Bitcoin is basically you, the owner of that Bitcoin, signing a certain transaction and saying that I transferred this Bitcoin to someone else. So I sign, my bitcoin transaction with the public key of a subsequent receiver with my secret key and then that becomes uh, that bitcoin becomes uh, or is will then be owned by someone else so maybe it starts from a miner it gets transferred to alice with the signature of the miner from alice it gets transferred to bob with alice's signature and so on right of course this, this these transactions have to go into a uh, uh, a global system uh, which is called a blockchain and that that's not part of the discussion today but this whole idea of digital signatures is is very very crucial in the context of of bitcoins there are attacks uh, to digital uh, signature based systems so the 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 european union resolution <coughs> resulted in the eidas authentication system which uh, for which very crucial, two very crucial vulnerabilities were reported and patched within a week in 2019. 
So the EIDAS node is an official software package that government organizations run on, on their own servers. The, the package failed to validate certificates used in, in their operations and attackers could actually forge certificates and hence pose as any EU citizen or business. But the moment this, uh, this vulnerability was exposed within a, within a week, that was patched as well. So it's not like it's, it's a foolproof system. Everything works always perfectly. There are quirks, there are problems which may keep coming up. But in my opinion, it's, it's still a very usable and, and secure alternative. Traditionally, uh, there have been forgeries. Uh, so the malware flame was one of the, one of the forgery attempts uh, that was made on, on Microsoft systems. So attackers identified a Microsoft certificate that was using a signing, uh, that, that was being used for signing the Microsoft code, the program updates. A weak hashing algorithm, MD5, was being used. So this led to a forgery uh, of, of uh, such a system. So effectively, uh, an attacker can actually send a piece of software, which is fraudulently signed, as if and and somebody who will uh, who receives that software will assume that yes th this is being sent by microsoft but it was actually not it was malware that was being sent so the malware appeared to have originated from microsoft so this this was also uh, rectified by replacing the hash algorithm as far as i can remember uh, so fake fake certificate generation is another uh, issue which has occurred before. So Komodo is a company uh, who reported that. Uh, uh, so they are basically a certificate selling authority. Uh, so the problem that happened was a user account of one of the registered authorities, so one of the uh, one of the key uh, people within the company. Uh, the 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 user account was breached. Some fake certificates were issued for several popular domain names such as Yahoo, Google, and Skype with ad additional control over the DNS servers. This would have proved very dangerous. <clears throat> Another one was reported uh, for DigiNotar. So they were hacked and fake certificates were issued. About 500 have been re reported and the company went bankrupt after that. And then of course, uh, Snowden, uh, Revelations bring us to uh, the question of a man in the or woman in the middle attack by NSA. So, what is suspected to have happened is an internet <coughs> router was hacked and a targeted traffic were being redirected. <coughs> the fake certificate was used for authentication. Now, Matthew Green he suggested that NSA could have obtained their own signing key from a less trustworthy CA and then used it to create and sign fake certificates. Bruce Schneider <coughs> suggests that the attack could be linked to the fake certificates issued from DigiNotar hack. Thank you very much. I think I've just finished on time. Dr. Sanjay Bhattacharji, thank you so much. I'm not entirely sure that I followed all of that, but uh, I did. I did try my try my very very best. Um, but thank you. What a what a tremendous um, tremendous run through there. Um, I, I, we do have um, uh, Amartya. I think is about to leave us, but feel free to unmute yourself if you're still there. Feel free to ask your questions. Sure. Sure. Thanks, Marcus. Uh, thanks, Sanjay. It was, it was very informative. And uh, uh, to a layman like me, I don't have the deep, you know, deep knowledge of it, but I could gather some of the very uh, nice information about digital signature and all. And my question, the first question, I have two, three questions, but I'll ask with the, you know, I'll start with the, uh, the, uh, the most important one. Suppose in a bank, someone goes and you know sign something in a digital path and that that gets verified instantaneously to get something you know some certificate or fd certificate uh, fixed deposit certificate or term loan certificate or whatever it may be uh, is this the 
are they using the uh, encryption public key or private key encryption for this or it is a different methodology to you know verify that signature instantane instantaneously so uh, if i understand your question what you're asking is uh, if i'm going to a bank and there is a, a pad um, sorry a tablet and there is a pen a digital pen which is kept there and i sign uh, on the tablet uh, to to get some financial transaction done then mm -hmm. uh, does that translate into a digital signature is that your yes. question yes okay. in a digital digital pad if i sign something yeah no so in that case it will not be uh, it will it will be equivalent to a a, a handwritten uh, signature but a digital copy of it however ah. however when i'm signing it and when that data is being sent it is being sent through an authenticated channel so so whenever such a system is being used the underlying uh, network connectivity in in most cases will be uh, will be secured by some form of uh, public key infrastructure okay but, brilliant but brilliant that okay. yeah but that particular uh, signature itself is not digital signature Okay, now and I got it. Uh, but the, whenever I have a digital signature, there has to be a, you know, key associated with that, and I have to keep keep that key in a very secret place, and then use that key for you know, so, you know, multiple usages. And you told in your talk that it will be time bound, and is the you know digital signature is uh, you know there is a time limit internationally to you know. Uh, keep that private or public key uh, okay so uh, so what you so if i understand your question uh, is there a standard uh, limit on the period right mm -hmm. uh, I, i think there is i think there is there but is. i i can't i can't claim make any claims at the moment i'll have to check okay sure Sure. So these are the couple of questions uh, I had, and uh, there are several other questions which I can take it offline because there are some uh, many other uh, you know attendees, and they are also willing to you know ask questions. So I leave it here, and thanks very much, Mr. Marcus, uh, Dr. Marcus, to you know put this up, and it was very informative. And I shall uh, henceforward I will. Uh, if you you know organize something, I will uh, request my office to join in this uh, uh, webinar as well because it is required. They need to know these things because I work for one company called Marketing Marsh, and they are also trying to build something blockchain and uh, this digital signature for their currency printing and this kind of stuff. So something like that, but I can put you across too. Uh, yeah, so uh, do that, uh, Mr. Roger Vinma, based out of uh, New York these days, but uh, he's an European Dutch, and he appreciates this kind of technologies, and he wants to invest in these things as well uh, to have uh, to have the right people, right technology, right uh, implementation, etc., etc., etc. So thanks very much, sir. Uh, All of you. That's that's very encouraging to hear, Omoto. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, of course. It is. It is encouraging for me that uh, but this university is, you know, putting up these kind of webinars, which uh, which I was not unaware aware of, and now I I see, you know, there is a you know, good research going on and uh, very nice, informative, very nice, fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you for your feedback. Yeah. yeah. Pleasure, pleasure. It's my pleasure. I, I uh, let me take a leave, with your permission, sir. Of course. Thank you. Oh, pleasure. Pleasure is all mine, sir. Okay. Did, were there any other questions that, whilst we've got Sanjay here, that we wanted to pose to him? Feel free to unmute yourself and make yourself known if there's any other questions from the participants. Hi, uh, Sanjay Das. Uh, thanks for the talk. And I actually had this question that how to remove this trust from the certificate authority. So can you elaborate a little bit on that? 
So, so, you all, so yeah. Yeah. So w one way of uh, doing it would be to to use uh, distributed systems like blockchains, right? So, uh, but uh, I'm not sure how how to. I mean, there there has to be some kind of uh, authority for the verification, right? Yeah. So one, it, so uh, I'm I'm not very sure about an immediate solution uh, to the centralized. Yeah, like for example, like the blockchain will give some different kind of digitalization, but I don't know how it actually verify the person. So that has to be done by some company and whatever they are doing right now, right? Yeah. So right. Yeah. Right. so I mean, if you think of uh, uh, the certifying authority, there I mean it has uh, several. Uh, several aspects to it right and and one of the key aspects is the fact that every time a uh, 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 a signature uh, sorry a certificate is generated uh, it's required to do a physical check or i mean an a, a rigorous identity check that of course cannot be done by blockchain yeah 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 the 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 storage of of that uh, of the certificate and its validity that can be done through smart contracts over, over a blockchain-based system, but not—I uh, mean, not everything can be done by blockchain. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sure. Okay. Thank you. Hello, Marcus. Uh, this is Shivoti. May I ask a question to Shanjay now? Yeah. Of course. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Shanjay, it was very good presentation. Very informative it was. So uh, my question was that uh, when Bob is uh, signing, um message uh, is there any security issue if he does uh, sign it directly uh, i mean not hashing the message first maybe uh, there will be an issue uh, efficiency wise because yes. uh, the message will be a long one and the hash will be a short one, short one yes. so by efficiency it will be uh, beneficial to do it on the hash of the message right. but with Will there be any issue of uh, security? I don't think, uh, I cannot think of any security issue. Do you think no, of that? No, yes. No, I agree with you. I, I don't think uh, it, there'll be any security issue. Uh, I think the problem will be efficiency. The fact that the hash uh, actually brings down the message into a very small digest, uh, which, which is probably, which, which will probably belong to a group or, yeah. And, and that number can be then used for, uh, to, uh, for in, for uh, signing, uh, that actually reduces the the burden on the algorithm. But other than that, uh, I don't think there there'll be any security issue. But there's nothing that's coming to my mind at the moment. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Shivati. Okay. Um, so, are there any, any other? questions that anybody wanted to ask before we wrap this session up no okay in that case then Sanjay thank you so much for your time uh, from our school of computing here at the University of Kent uh, we'll make sure that this recording is put up on the main um, enterprise website and so you'll be able to, uh, to to watch that again at your leisure uh, and of course we're going to distribute the slides aren't we so that they'll be uh, available for everybody to, to use. But Dr. Sanjay Bhattacharji, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Marcus, for this opportunity. I really enjoyed speaking. Thank you. And the discussions. Thank you.